Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Phase Shift of the Sine and the Cosine Function, Part 1. So the title doesn't make this sound very important, but actually it's incredibly important because, as I mentioned about a thousand times, sine and cosine functions are probably some of the most important functions we have in math. Part of the reason is because that wave shape is used to describe everyday phenomena, like light waves. <clears throat> Even when we get into quantum mechanics and talk about photons, it's still described in terms of sine and cosine. So in the previous lessons, we've learned how to shift the sine and cosine, change the period, change the amplitude. Here we're going to uh, uh, deal with the last little bit that we need to put the pieces of the puzzle together, and that's called the phase shift. When we change the phase of a sine and a cosine function, we move it along the x-axis. So we're going to do a computer demo in a second where I can show you visually how that happens. And also, I want you in the back of your mind to know why we care. Because if a light wave or any other wave uh, where it has a crest and a trough of that shape is propagating or, or, or uh, traveling in a certain direction, then it's going to look like it's constantly shifting phase in the whatever in the x direction or the direction of travel. So once you know how to write down a, a sine or a cosine and shift the phase, then you automatically know how to write down what a traveling wave looks like. And since traveling waves are used all over physics and engineering, it's really one of the most important functions that we can learn. So our roadmap is I'm going to go to the computer. I'm going to show you graphically how this works for sine and cosine. And then we'll come back into to the board and describe a little bit of the, th of the theory and do a little more drawings to shore up our understanding. And then we'll solve our problems. The last thing I will say before we actually go and, and do the computer demo is remember, we already talked about how to shift any function we want along the x axis. We've done that before, even a function like x squared. Uh, for instance, I'll just tell you real quick, if we have like uh, f of x uh, is equal to x squared, how do you shift that function? What you do is you replace the x variable with something. If you replace it with you know, x minus a number, then the thing is shifted to the right. If you replace it with x plus a number, it's shifted to the left. So we're going to review that as well. So for now, let's go ahead and just keep those thoughts in your mind. Let's go to the computer and learn how sine and cosines can move and propagate in space. All right, here we are in front of the computer. We have a standard cosine plotted. Uh, starts at 1, goes down to negative 1, goes up uh, again to its starting position over a 2 pi interval. So this is one cycle on the right, one cycle on the left. The function I'm plotting is the cosine function, but I've replaced the variable with x minus something. Now, what I've what I've got here is subtracting 0 times pi. So really, it's just subtracting 0 initially. And so that's why it looks like an unchanged cosine function, because this just goes to 0. Now, let me just show you graphically what happens. As I change the number inside of the cosine, the blue curve is plotting the result. And as I continue increasing this number, you can sort of see the wave sliding to the right. And if you put your thinking cap on and really just like visualize it. If I drag my uh, mouse with a constant sort of speed, then you can imagine this as being a propagating wave going to the right. And that's exactly what it is. Now I'm going to show you how to write that down in a minute. Uh, but that is the reason we learned this, uh, to be honest with you. So look at what's going on. As you take x and the argument of this thing is x gets replaced with x minus a number. Let's take a look at what happens. If I could grab this gold function and shift it all the way to the right by 2 pi, notice 2 pi is the period of the function, if I could shift it right by 2 pi, then I would end up with a cosine that would look exactly like this one because I would be shifting it one period and so everything would line up. So as you see, as I go through these intermediate values and end up where I shift it by 2 pi, notice we have x minus 2 times pi, then we have shifted the cosine one complete cycle so it lines up with the original function, and what you have is basically what you have started with. So when you shift the cosine to the right by one period, then you get exactly what you started with. Now let me go back to zero here, and what if we shift the other way? So when you have a minus sign in here, it shifts to the right. When you put a plus sign in here, like this way, uh, it shifts to the left. Now notice the way I've written here is x minus a minus 0 0.6 pi. So this becomes a plus. So this is like x plus 0.6 pi. And if I keep going to the left and shift it to x plus 2 pi, then again, I get exactly the function I started with. So isn't that kind of neat? The way the cosine and the sine work, if you shift it one period, either to the left like it is here, 
or to the right like it is right here, then you get exactly what you start with. Now let's go back to the zero point. Instead of shifting it one full complete period, let's take a look at what happens if we shift it half of a period. So if, if one period's two pi, then half of a period is just one pi. So if I shift it, there's 0 0.1 pi, 0 0.2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, Let's go back. It looks like I passed it up one pi. So here I've shifted it x minus one pi. So x minus pi. So I've done a phase shift where the blue curve is shifted to the right by exactly pi units. Notice how it kind of like uh, it, it becomes a, an, an inverted version of the original cosine function. Notice the original cosine has a starting point here, but now the inverted, the, the shifted version is uh, exactly the mirror image reflection over the x-axis, so it, it maps everything down. The gold down here becomes the blue up here and so on. So when you shift a cosine or a sine by half of a period, then it's the same thing as inverting and kind of flipping the, the, the cosine over, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So if you shift the cosine by a complete period, where we shift by x minus 2 pi, or 2 pi shift to the right, we get exactly what we start with. But if we only shift half of a period, uh, which is shifting by 1 pi, then we get this inverted version of that. Remember that, because I'm going to talk about that in the lecture. Now, I want to show you something else very, very interesting. If we go back to the zero point, Let's say that we don't shift by pi, or, or 2 pi, and we don't shift by pi, let's shift it by pi over 2. Look at this right here. If I shift like that, that's 0 0.1 pi, 0 0.2 pi, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 pi, that's shifting by pi over 2, which is the same as 0.5 pi. Notice the blue curve is shifted just a little bit to the right by exactly pi over 2, because originally, the cosine curve was a peak right here at the origin, but when I shift it by pi over two, the new peak of the curve is right here at pi over two radians. So the blue curve is the shifted version when we shift by pi over two. But I want you to stare at this and look at this blue curve. What does it look like to you? See, the gold curve is a cosine because it starts up high, but the blue curve starts at the origin here, goes up to a maximum, down, and then it again completes a cycle in 2 pi. The blue curve is a sine function. So you see, because the cosine curve and the sine curve have exactly the same shape, then if I shift it just enough, I can actually change a cosine into a sine function. Cosine and sine are very much related because they have the same range of values, the same shape. They're just a shifted version of one another. So really, any wave that's actually propagating or traveling, you can write it in terms of a cosine function. You can also write it in terms of a sine function. Neither is going to be incorrect because sine and cosine are cousins of each other. The only difference is that they're shifted relative to one another, so much so that I can take a cosine and I can literally shift it and turn it into a sine function. All right, now what I'd like to do is go do the same exercise with the sine graph, which is what we have here. Here I have the sine of a function. It starts at zero, goes up, and then down to its minimum, and then back up in two pi period. So it's x minus zero times pi. So x minus zero, there's no phase shift happening right now. If I shift this thing to the right by inserting a subtraction in the phase there, and if I go all the way to shifting it by two pi, then I've shifted this sine exactly one cycle forward. So I end up lining up with exactly what I started with. If I shift, shift by two pi, then I get a curve that is unchanged. If I go and do the same thing, let me go back to zero here. Here's the zero point. If I shift to the left, I have it as minus minus, but this is really X plus a phase shift. Then it shifts the curve to the left. And if I shift the curve to the left again by two times pi, then again, the curve I get is exactly the same shape as the curve that I started with. So I shift it to the right by two pi, I get the same thing I started with, a sine. If I shift it to the left by two pi, I get the same thing, a sine. Same thing that's happening with the cosine function. Now let's, instead of doing that, we start with our regular sine curve. Let's not shift it by two pi, which is one cycle. Let's shift it by half of that. So we're going to shift it by one pi, which is half of a cycle. So if I take a, a sine and shift it by pi to the right, look at what happens. My sine becomes an inverted version of itself. When I shift it pi units to the right, what happens is this peak goes over here and this gold peak down here goes to this peak right here. And so now since you shift by pi, it's a mirror image reflection over the x-axis, exactly the same thing the cosine was doing a minute ago. And then finally, if we go back to the zero point where they're lined up, here is my regular sine wave. Now I'm going to shift this guy by pi over 2, 
And what I'm going to get is this, because this is uh, shifting by x minus 0.5 pi, which is pi over 2. Then the blue curve is, what is the blue curve now? So we start with a sine and we shift it, it turns into a, a cosine, but sort of an inverted cosine down here because it starts on the bottom end. If we actually go the other direction, like this, if we shift it the other direction, so it becomes x plus 0.5 uh, or pi over 2, then your sine curve becomes a cosine. So the bottom line is, that I really want you to know, is that if I take a cosine function like this and I shift it to the right, by pi over 2, then I can turn it into a sine function, which is the new the blue curve turns into a sine function, right? And then if I start out with a sine function, and if I shift it to the left to put this peak right here on the axis, the left by how much? By pi over 2, then it turns into a cosine. So the punchline is you can turn any sine curve and write it in terms of a cosine, but you have to put a phase shift in order to make it slide and turn it into a cosine. And you can take any cosine and you can write it in terms of a sine if you do an appropriate phase shift, right? Now, the last thing I'll look at, let me slide here, I wrote a note to myself. Uh, look at what happens before you read that. Look at what happens to this cosine here. If we start here, if we want to envision what, what do we use these sinusoids for, we use them for a lot of things. But one thing we learn is we can write down what a wave looks like when it's traveling through space, like a light wave or an electromagnetic wave is another uh, word for it. So if I increase the phase a little bit, then the wave is displaced to the right. But if I keep displacing it in time so that this number over here, the 0.7 pi, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger in time, then what happens is the wave is propagating to the right. The crest of, uh, of this wave is constantly moving and carrying energy in the direction of motion. So when a wave hits you, it's carrying energy because the crest and the trough are slamming into you. The whole wave is slamming into you, but that's, that's one way to visualize it is the crest and the trough is moving in time. But in order to get this illusion of the wave moving, I have to kind of constantly shift the phase. So in other words, here the phase shift is zero, here the phase shift is 0.1 pi, then 0.2 pi, and 0.3 pi, and 0.4 pi, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, I have to constantly increase it. So as time goes up, if I replace this number with something that goes up with time, then if I put a new variable time in there and keep increasing it with time, then the wave will be always propagating to the right uh, as time goes on. So that's what this note is down here. If I write down cosine of x minus t, where t is time in seconds, then this will represent a wave traveling to the right because the phase shift, notice it's x minus t, the phase shift is time in seconds and will constantly be going up. And that, it will manifest itself when you're graphing the thing, it'll manifest itself as a wave propagating to the right if you make the phase shift always go up with time. So if you just stick time in here, then as time goes on, the phase shift gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the minus sign means it goes to the right. So in that case, when the time is going up all the time, the phase shift is going up all the time, the wave is propagating to the right. Okay, let me reset my starting point. The second note under there is saying if you write the wave as cosine of x plus the time in seconds, then what you're doing is the plus means it's shifted to the left, and since t is in seconds, as time ticks on, the phase shift is going up and up and up and up, but uh, because it's a plus sign, the wave will be traveling to the left, and that is illustrated by what I'm saying here, that here is a no shift at all, but as I start shifting and adding a phase shift constantly with time, every second that goes by, I increase the phase shift, then the wave will propagate to the left. So that is a wrap up of what we have here. We can turn sines into cosines with phase shift. We can turn cosines into sines with phase shift. We can uh, invert a cosine or a sine by shifting by a period, by a half of a period, in this case pi. And we can also create the equation for a traveling wave moving in the plus x or the, plus, or the minus x direction by allowing this phase shift to always increase or decrease in time. And that is how we write. This is the way we write. When you take physics or engineering, you will write down a traveling wave as a a variation of, of this equation, x minus t inside of the cosine. You could also write the wave in terms of a sine. You could write it as sine x minus t also, and it'll be the, uh, the very similar shape, shape, but it will be shifted a little bit relative to this. So now let's go back to the board and continue solving our problems and learning how to sketch these guys. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the computer demo. I think personally that uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and a movie is worth a million trillion words. So when I was animating and showing you what was happening with the graphs, I really hope that that 
brings it home how you can take a cosine or a sine and write down a traveling wave. Now, of course, when we get into physics and engineering, you know, the equations are a little bit more complex than what I wrote there, but the bones of it is actually what I just wrote there. So you now know the fundamental, you know, when you open up a book in electromagnetic wave, like an antenna book, an antenna theory book, or a microwave transmission book, the equations that we use to describe them, they look a little different, but the bones of them are basically what I showed you in the computer. When you change the phase and allow the phase to always increase with time, then you write down a traveling wave. Now, before we get into drawing pictures of phase shifts and all that, let's start kind of at the beginning. Let's take a look and graph the following function. And we already did it over there in the computer, but let's talk about it a little bit more. F of X is negative sine of X. What does that look like? All right, what you need to think about this is you need to think about the base function and how what I've written on the board changes the base function, all right? So for instance, if I wanted to sketch this guy, then what I would do is I would just draw some coordinate axes right here, and I would say x, and I would say I'm gonna graph f of x, which is equal to negative sine of x. Now, the base function is just the same thing without the negative sign. So sine of x, I already know what the period is. The period goes to two pi, and so that means half of the period is right here at pi, and so half of this is pi over two, and so this is pi over two, two pi over two, and then this will be three pi over two, and so you can set your axis up as if I'm gonna draw this guy. Right? And since, for, again, forgetting about the negative one, since it's a regular sine function, we know that it's gonna go up to a maximum of one and down to a minimum of negative one. And if it were a regular sine function, it would just start here, it would go up, it would come down, and then it would go up like this, one cycle in a two pi region. So that's what would happen if I didn't have this negative sign here. When I have this negative sign here, uh, when I have this negative sign here, how does it change? If I was gonna create a table of values to graph this thing, then what I would do is I would calculate negative sine of x. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the sine of the angle, you're gonna get the answer to that, and then you're gonna stick a negative sign on the, on, the, on the number. So if sine gives you back one half, then what you really plot on here is negative one half. If the sign gives you, you know, uh, 0.852, then you actually you put a negative sign, so it's negative 0.852. Likewise, if you get a negative answer, if the sign returns, you know, negative 0.46, then when you put a negative on front, it changes it to a positive 0.46. So for every number you get back in your original sine curve, really what you're plotting is the negative version of that. That's why it's a mirror image reflection over the x-axis as I showed you in the video there. So again, a normal sine function would go up to a maximum and then down to a minimum, but because this has a negative sign, really this one is gonna start here and it's gonna go to a minimum here and then up through here and a maximum is gonna be right over here and then back to zero right here. So whereas a normal sign would go up, down, up, this one is gonna go down and then up and then down again. So when you have a sine, a, a sine or a cosine with a negative sign on front, what it does is it flips the thing upside down. But instead of memorizing, I don't want you to memorize that it flips it upside down. I want you to think about why. Because any number you get back from the sine function is just going to be negated. So if it gives me normally a, a value up here, I'm going to immediately negate it so it becomes down here. If it usually gives me a... a, a a, a number down here, which is negative, it's going to put it up here. And so that's why it's plotted upside down like this. Okay, so putting a negative sign onto a sinusoid simply mirror image reflects it over the axis like this. Now let's just uh, double check that. So we plotted this function, a prettier version of it, so you can see negative sine of x does exactly what we drew on the board. It goes down to a minimum of negative one, and then the maximum goes over there over a two pi region. So it's literally as if I just rotated this thing and flipped it about the x-axis. Now, we just did a lesson on phase shifts, okay? We, we are kind of combining multiple things here. We already know that sines and cosines have the same shape. And we know now that we can slide them back and forth by what we execute what we call a phase shift. So even though what we have plotted here is the function negative sine of x, just for giggles, you could write this thing differently. You could say f of x is gonna be equal to sine of something, sine of x with some phase shift. So where is the normal sine function? The normal sine function is right here. 
all right? So if you need to visualize this with me a little bit here, the normal sine function goes up, down, up. If I shift it, and then of course it's gonna go down this way, right? So it's gonna go like this and then up like this. If I were to grab it and slide it to the right, then the, the trough that would have been here will then be here. How far do I have to shift it? We just saw it there. Since a full cycle is called two pi, by shifting by a half cycle, which is in this case pi, is what's gonna do it. So you could basically shift it by plus or minus pi to basically, uh, to basically reproduce this graph here. So if you take a normal sign, which is this, a crest right here, shift it to the right by how many units, then this point would go here. The, the crest would become here, and notice the crest was here and the crest was here. This is a shift of pi. This would become here, the, after it goes down here, this one would become over here. This is a shift of pi in the positive direction. But since everything is symmetrical, you could shift it in the negative x direction. So the plus sign shifts it to the left, the negative sign shifts it to the right, but it doesn't matter if you, uh, you could write it as a phase shift of sine of x plus pi or sine of x minus pi because the thing is symmetric no matter which way I move, if I move pi units, that's half a cycle, it's gonna line up with this right here. All right, now let's move along to problem number two right? Let's plot the function f of x is equal to negative sine of 2x. Now what's going on here? And of course the 2x is, is wrapped in parentheses and the sine is what's acting on this. This is exactly the same function as before. The only difference is we've now increased the frequency. Remember the number in front of the variable inside of the sinusoid, that is what we're going to, what we talk, talked about in the past called the frequency. And what it means is instead of a regular sign making a cycle over two pi radians, we must now have two complete cycles in the same window. So this is like your speed multiplier. It, it wiggles it faster, which means higher frequency. Now we have to have two complete cycles of this function inside of a normal two pi period for that guy there. So let's go and draw and see what this looks like. Like this. All right, so what we're gonna say is here we have x and here we have f of x. All right, now let's think about this for a second before we get too trigger happy. Let's go ahead and draw our thing. So let's put two pi, we know that's gonna be important. This is gonna be a pi, and this right here is gonna be pi over two, and this is gonna be three pi over uh, two. Now this one has a, uh, there's no coefficient change out there, so we know it's gonna go up to either plus one uh, or minus one. Now a normal sign goes up and then down and then it goes like up and then down and then up where one period is in a two pi window. But since there's a two there, we know there has to be two cycles in a two pi window. Two cycles in a two pi window. And if you're not sure about that, what you could do is you could just take this number. We could say two pi over the number that's here. This is how we did it before is equal to uh, the period P. Right, and so then we cancel this out and the period P is equal to pi. So now the period has to be pi to get one cycle here and then another cycle right there. So knowing that this means we have to have two cycles in a two pi window or actually calculating the period is, is fine either way. So to actually, to actually make progress with this, what we know is that normally it would have to go up and then down and then up, but that's a normal sign here we have a negative sign which flips it over. So what it means is it has to go, we have a ma minimum there and a maximum there. It's gonna have to go down, hit this one, then go up, then it get this one and down like this. Now we have one cycle in a one pi period. And then the same thing here, it's gonna be down here, it's gonna be up here. So it's gonna go down, then up, and then down like this. So here we have, again, it's a, it's a multi-step process. The first thing you do is say, what does the two mean? We calculate the period. If it was a normal sign, it would go up, down, up, and then up, down, up, two cycles in a two pi period. But since we have the minus sign, it gets flipped upside down. So down, up, down, that's one cycle. Down, up, down, that's another cycle. Now, just to um, shed some more light on it, let's graph this thing and see if it does in fact look like this. So if we go over here, I have that second graph over here. This is a graph of negative sine of 2x. It starts at the origin, it goes down, up, down, one cycle over pi, and then down, up, down, and then the next cycle. So we have two cycles over a two pi period, and the thing is inverted. So now what I'd like to do is take some of these down, erase what I have so far, talk a little bit more about the phase shift, why the phase shift works, why does it mathematically shift the, way, the function to the left or to the right, and then we'll do a couple of problems to wrap up this lesson. 
All right, now the next thing we need to do is really understand or maybe remind ourselves uh, why a phase shift like that actually shifts a cosine or a sine. The first thing for you to remember is that it's not just cosines and sines that we can do. We, we can shift these things. We can shift any function, and we have learned it in the past. So it's something you already know, you just may not be aware of it. So if we take, uh, for instance, the function, uh, so let's pick something that's not a sinusoid. Let's pick a sine, uh, just a regular function. Probably the easiest function that's not a straight line is just a typical parabola. It goes down here, goes up like this. And so that's f of x is equal to x squared, right? So what we're basically saying is that we can uh, change, uh, make a modification to the variable there to shift this graph to the right or to the left by however many units we want, right? So let's, for instance, take a look at the function f of x is equal to, instead of x squared, we'll, we'll still have something squared, but we're going to replace the variable with x minus, let's call it minus 2. So what you're doing is you still have a quantity squared, but what the thing that you're squaring is not just the variable, it's a variable minus a number. And then we'll also do the same thing with a uh, variable plus a number. We'll do the same thing here. f of x uh, is equal to x minus, call it minus 3, or plus 3, sorry, squared, just for some variety. All right, so let's go and do that. The first one here I will draw relatively close by and try to leave enough room to do this one right here, right? So this is the situation we have. So what I'm telling you is what this is going to do, this x minus 2, minus signs shift the base function to the right. So 1, 2. So this is a positive 2. And then the parabola is going to go down and touch basically right there and go up. The entire graph is shifted over. And plus signs shift it negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 units to the left. And so this one is going to go down like this. Now the question is, you can memorize that, but why is it that minus signs push it to the right and plus signs push it to the left? because it's a little backwards. You kind of think that a minus sign, you know, because minus is to the left, you kind of think it should go that way. So the way you do this, the way you visualize this, is what you do is you say, okay, this is a new function. It's going to be graphed somewhere. What happens if I put a 2 into this function? If I put a 2 into this function for x, then it's 2 minus 2, which is 0. 0 squared is 0. So at the number for an input value of x is equal to 2, this is the input, the x, here, what it produces as an output is zero. So that means, because the only point on this graph is, the, the only zero on this graph is right here at the very bottom. So if it's producing a zero, that has to be the bottom of the parabola. All right, and then if I put like three into this graph, then I'll get three minus two, which is one, and one squared is gonna be like one unit to the right of my zero point. It's gonna be like returning this value, but it's gonna be returning it one unit to the right of the number two. If I put 4 in here, then it's going to be 4 minus 2, which is 2, and 2 squared is 4. So it's going to be like originally over here, there was 2, and then there was over here 4, because 2 squared is 4, like this. So at an input of 2, an output comes of 4, but over here I have to put an input of 4 in to get the 2, to square it, to get the 4. So it's going to be 2 units to the right here. So you see what's happening? It's almost like for every function you need to pick like a zero point. Just think of where the x, y axis crosses. At 0, 0, where is the function there? And then that, as you move it and shift it around, that's kind of your zero point of the function, and that is going to move with the shift. So we know that it has to shift two units to the right, because putting this x minus 2 here means that I have to put in bigger numbers for x to get 0 here, which is my zero point of the function. The original zero point is down here at the origin, but here I have to put bigger values of x in. I have to put 2 in just to get a 0 to square it here. And then I have to put even bigger numbers in to get on the right side of the parabola, and then slightly smaller, lower values than the number 2 to get this. So it shifts every point to the right because this is changing my zero point. All right? Meaning the value to get a 0 squared here, I have to put a number in bigger than I did over there. Because here I only have to put 0 in to get 0 squared. Here I have to put 2 in to get 0 squared. What happens here? What do I have to put in here to get 0 squared? I have to put a negative 3 in. That's why the 0 point is shifted to the left. Because putting a x plus 3 means I have to put the negative 3 in in order to get 0 squared, which is the bottom of my function here. So that's why the signs are flipped from where you normally think. The minus sign uh, shifts the thing to the right because it makes me put larger values in for x than I usually do for the base function. And so, but that happens for all points, so it shifts it all to the right. 
And if I have x plus a number, then I have to put smaller numbers in, in this case negative 3, I have to put smaller numbers in in order to get to the zero point of my function. And all of them are shifted that way, so it shifts it all of them to the left. So minus signs shift to the right, plus signs shift to the left. That is what you need to remember. And the y of it, I hope you remember, but honestly, if you just remember that the rule, I'm okay with it. All right, now what we wanna do for our next problem is we want to actually uh, shift uh, and do an actual shift uh, to, to generalize this. And we've actually done this before, but we're gonna sketch it and then we'll look at a picture here. Let's graph or sketch f of x is equal to uh, cosine x minus pi over two, x minus pi over two. So before you do anything, the way you read this is, okay, I've replaced the cosine of x function I've replaced the x value with something else, and it's x minus a number. Yeah, it's pi over two, and it looks like an ugly number, but it's just x minus a number. So what this minus sign is gonna do is shift the whole cosine to the right. How much does it shift? By the number pi over two. Pi is 3.14, so pi over two is like 1.57, or some, some place close to that with decimals that go on forever. So it's shifting the cosine, entire cosine curve, uh, to the right, because of the minus sign, by about 1.5, a little bit more than 1.5, which is exactly equal to pi over two. So the way you draw these things is first you need to, to, to shift the, or draw the original function before you try to draw, uh, in my opinion, the shifted version of it, right? We know it's a cosine, so we know it can only go up to a positive one or a minimum of negative one. And we know that a regular cosine there's still nothing in front of the x, the speed multiplier, the frequency, there's nothing in front of the x other than a one, so it's still gonna have a, uh, a, a, a two pi period, and this is pi right here, and this is pi over two, and this is three pi over two. Now I'm drawing the original unshifted version to compare with, so cosine of x is what I'm drawing here. How would that work, or how would that look like? We start at a maximum, we go down through here, we go to minimum at pi, then we go up through here, and then a maximum at two pi, so that's one full cycle, right? We want to draw usually the un, unadulterated version so that in our mind we can start applying changes to it. If you try to draw these functions without drawing the baseline function, it gets very confusing, especially if I start doing multiple things to, you know, if I shift it up, phase shift it to the right, change the amplitude, then everything gets very confusing, so you have to draw a baseline. This is the baseline cosine function. Now that we have that on paper and we can look at it, then we can more easily figure out what to do uh, over here. And so here we're gonna plot cosine of x minus pi over two. All right, so again, the first thing we know is that it can only go up to a positive one and a negative one because there's nothing in front of the cosine. And we know that there's no shifting up or down, so we're not gonna do anything like that. There's nothing in front of the x other than the one, so it's gonna, it's gonna have a two pi a two pi um, period, and so again, this is pi, and this is pi over two, and this is three pi over two. All right, now what's it gonna look like? Well, the original cosine function did this, so it's like taking this thing, and if also it's it's helpful to, to also kind of like continue this down off to the left here. So I usually draw it like this, but this, this peak continues down here. And since this is at pi over two, this is gonna be at negative pi over two right here, this crossing point. So if I grab this function, if I could just grab the blue curve and move it to the right by pi over two, that's what my shift is, then this bottom point is gonna be here, the crest will be up here, and then every point will move. So the bottom will be at the origin, the peak of this thing right here where the top of the cosine is, is actually gonna be shifted to the right by pi over two. This crossing point will then go to pi. This trough, which is at pi now, is gonna go pi over two to the right, which is right here. And then the, Z, the uh, uh, let's see, right, uh, what am I looking at here? And then this one here, this crossing point is gonna now then move to two pi right here. So let's see if we can draw it, right? So what we have is it's gonna look up, go up like this, then it's gonna cross down through this point, then it's gonna go up through this, and it's gonna go up like this. So this is what cosine of x minus pi over two looks like. And what does it look like, ladies and gentlemen? It looks like a sine wave. Not only does it look like a sine wave, it is a sine wave. Because all the points on the cosine curve are the same points as the, the points on the sine curve. They're all the same, they're just shifted relative to one another. Look at your table of trig uh, values. You know, sine can return one half, cosine can return one half. 
uh, sine can return square root of three over two, cosine can return square root of three over two. And all the negatives, they can both return square root of two over two, they can both return one, they can both return minus one, they can both return zero. They're all shifted relative to another. And when we grab this function, literally, and move it by this much, by pi over two, then it literally becomes a, co a, a sine function. All right, so I've got it written down here. I don't feel the need to write all the words, but what I wrote in my paper is exactly the following. Sine and cosine are identical shape. Sine is just a cosine that is shifted right by pi over two along the x-axis or along the angle, the, the theta axis, because these are all the x variable. We often rename it to be theta, which is an angle measure, right? And so what you can then say with certainty is that the sine of any angle x or theta, whatever you want to put in there, is equal to the cosine function shifted by pi over two radians. This is a trig identity. Now we're going to get into trig identities a lot more later. There's a whole bunch of them. But this is the kind of thing you see in a book and you don't even know why it's there and you're just told to memorize it. What we're saying is that the sine curve, if you plot it, in, in the cosine of the curve x minus pi over two, if you plot that, if you overlay them on top of each other, every single point on the sine curve will line up with every single point on this curve. Therefore, both functions are identical. And when we say that there's an identity in math or in trig, it means there's an absolute equality between two things. All right. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to give a general analogy, but you know, there's, 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 there's just different ways of expressing things in math, like there's different ways of expressing things in real life. In real life, I might say it's sunny, uh, or I might say it's, it's uh, no clouds in the sky. Okay, so if it's sunny, and there's no clouds out in the sky, and of course it's daytime, then you know that both of those are the same thing. They're identical, just different ways of saying the same thing. And what I'm saying is, this thing is, is exactly the same to the point where if I'm simplifying some equation that has this ugly thing in it, and I'm like, man, that's not gonna be fun to play with, but then I remember, oh, wait a minute, it's just equal to this, then I can literally erase this from my equation and just replace it with this, because this and this are identical to each other. And in trig, and we'll get into it later, we're gonna have entire tables of identities where one thing is equal to another. And this is one that I'm going out of my way to explain why it's true, because it has such important consequences for studying sines and cosines and things like this. That's where it comes from, because if you grab this guy, shift it by pi over two, then you can get the other curve. So sines and cosines are identical other than a pi over two phase shift. That's a fancier way of saying the same thing. And so you can even go further. You can say in general, so in general, right, in general, you can say that sine of x minus some shift or cosine of x minus some shift, which d is just some number here, this is a, these two things are a shift right d units, right, d units. So if I shift it right by five, then the whole thing gets moved to the right by five, or whatever it is. And you have the same thing of, uh, with a plus sign here. You could say sine of x plus some shift. You could say the cosine of x plus some shift. And this is a shift left d units. And we already went over y with the uh, example there, with the computer demo as well. All right, we're almost done. The next thing I want to point out, just to give you a little more practice with an actual problem, is the following. Let's graph f of x equals to two times the sine of x minus pi. Now you should start to look at these things and understand how to read them. The two means we take the basic sign shape and we change the amplitude. We make it go up to two and then down to negative two. We change its amplitude, make it taller, right? And then the x minus pi means after we do that first step, we shift the whole thing to the right by pi units. And pi units is half of a period because all these sinusoids, the base period is two pi. So we're gonna shift it to the right one half of a period, which is pi units. And we're also gonna stretch it vertically. Let's sketch this guy, and then I will show you a, a nice picture of it to make sure you understand. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna graph the base function. So we'll say the base uh, is equal to a sine of x without any real changes to it, right? Uh, and then we will 
put our changes to it to see if we can do it. So here we have x, and here we have this graph of sine of x. And we've done this so many times, you know 2 pi is a period, then this is pi right here, this is pi over 2, and this is 3 pi over 2, like this. And then it goes up to, um, here's 1, here's 2, 1, 2, and then negative 1, negative 2, so negative 1, negative 2. Now what I could do is I could just literally draw the base sign, goes up to 1 and so on, but just to, because we're learning about phase shifts, let's just graph the, let's call the base function 2 times sine of x. So we can see what 2 times the sine of x looks like and then we'll handle the phase shift in the last step. Because the sine is going to go up to its maximum, but the maximum is now going to be 2, and it's going to go down through here, and the minimum is going to be negative 2. So it's going to go up to a maximum, down through here to a minimum, and then back up like this. It's a sine, so it starts at 0, minima, a maximum, minimum, and then uh, back around to its starting point in uh, in 2 pi. There's nothing in front of the x to increase the frequency or change the period, so the period is the normal period of a sine function. So I'm going to call this the base. Well, what I mean by that is everything except the phase shift. All right. Now let's go on and draw what the actual full-blown function looks like and see how close we can get. So x, and here's f of x, which is 2 times the sine of x minus pi. All right. So what we can say here is we have uh, 2 pi, and then we have pi right here, and then we have pi over 2, and then we have 3 pi over 2. Now we know this thing is going to go up to 2, so here's 1, here's 2, and here's negative 1, here's negative 2, like this. Now the normal function, we already uh, drew it right here, it starts and it goes up like this. So shifting by pi is basically going to be the same as grabbing this purple curve and moving it to the right. Now again, it's because we're moving it to the right, uh, it would be nice if you have negative pi over 2, you have negative pi right here, if you just kind of remember that this thing is going to go on the negative side up like this, right? Because when you grab it and move it to the right, it's kind of helpful to have what's over here kind of in your mind. So what's going to happen is when you grab this thing and move it pi units, this point is going to be here, this crest is going to be pi units over here, this is going to, this entire kind of upside down part is going to be moved pi units, which means it's going to be over there. So what it's going to do is it's going to go uh, down and then up through pi, like this, and then over here is going to be a maximum uh, over here, and then it's going to go down. So it's going to go down here, then up here, then down here like this. Right? Why? Because we grab this and we shift it, so we know it's going to be like this, we've got this, and then this one is going to be moved, again, pi units over here, so it's going to go and continue like this. So it's going to go down, then up, then down. And of course, I stopped it here at 2 pi, but I could go to 4 pi and just give me, an, I could give another cycle if I wanted to, or carry it as far as I want to in the, um, in the, in the x direction here. Okay? So let's just double check and see if this is correct. The shifted version here, uh, is shifted to the right by pi and also is multiplied by 2, so it goes uh, to plus or minus 2. Let us see if that is correct here. So here is the graph, 2 times the sine of x minus pi, and so it goes down and up through pi and then to 2 pi, and then here I took the graph to 4 pi, so I gave myself another cycle just to kind of see what it looks like. But you see it's the same thing, down, up, down, like this. All right. So let me point out something that we've mentioned many times before, and that is that when we take a, notice the, uh, what we've done is we have taken 2 times the sine of x and we shifted it to the right, and what we end up getting is an inverted sine. Because remember, the regular sine goes up, I mean you can see it right here, it goes up like this, but after we do a, a phase shift of pi, it goes down, up, down. So it's like mirror image reflecting everything that we had, right? It's like flipping it upside down. And any time you shift a sinusoid by pi, you get the same function back, but flipped upside down, right? Because it's, you're shifting it by half of a period. So basically, what we have learned by doing this is if we take the sine, and if we take it and shift it to the left with a plus sign by pi, we're going to get the same thing as if we take the sine function and if we shift it to the right by pi, which what we're going to get back from it is going to be negative sine of x. We just take the original function and flip it over with a negative 1. You can see that we've taken this and shifted it to the right by pi, which is exactly the same thing as flipping it over. And the same thing is true of cosine. So cosine of x plus pi is exactly the same thing as cosine 
of x minus pi as a phase shift. So a phase shift of plus or a minus pi gives you the exact same thing, which is negative cosine of x. So if you take a sine and you shift it, and this is, these are another set of identities. I told you there's a lot of identities you learn in, in trig, but most students, including me, when I learned it, they didn't, I didn't know where it come from. I mean, I was like, okay, thanks. I, I really appreciate it. But I don't remember or know where, maybe I never learned where they came from. They come from the fact that these are phase shifts. And the regular period of a sine function is 2 pi. So if I shift it by half of that, then all the crests are just going to become troughs, which means I just multiply by negative 1 on the sine, because that I already know from before is what flips it upside down. But because the period is 2 pi, if I shift by half of a period one way, it's the same thing as shifting by half of a period the other way. I showed you that on the computer. Here, I grabbed this guy and moved it uh, half of a period to the right, and this is what I got. But if instead of moving it to the right, I'd move it to the left, then this would become over here, and uh, what was over here would become over here, and I would get exactly the same thing. So this is the, this is the first one here, shifting by uh, to the right by pi or to the left by pi, which is half of a period, just flips the sign upside down. That's how you translate the math into words. If I take a cosine function and I shift it to the right by pi, which is half a period, or to the left by pi, which is half a period, then I get the same cosine curve back, but just inverted, flipped upside down. So the point here is that you can shift a cosine or a sine half of a period, and when you do that, it's the same as taking an original cosine function and just flipping it upside down. That's what it means. So we're done with this lesson. And in this lesson, we have learned a lot. We have learned why shifting to the right and shifting to the left works. I showed you that with parabola, f of x equals x squared. We did the computer demo to show you how it works, right? And then here on the board, we get into the nitty gritty and really sketching them and showing you how you would do it with from a blank sheet of paper without knowing what the answer is. And for all of these examples, I sort of drew and sketched a baseline before I applied a phase shift. Because if I try to shift while increasing this or maybe inverting it or something, it's very hard to do. So draw a base, visualize where everything's going to go in what direction, and then draw it. And then we learn some identities. And the identities we learned, the main two ones that we learned here are as follows. If we take a sine or a cosine, shift it by half of a period, which is plus or minus pi, in either direction, we get the original function back but flipped upside down with a negative sign. That is what these identities tell us. The other identities we said, that we uh, said, is that instead of shifting by pi, if I shift by pi over 2, I can turn a cosine into a sine. And I showed you on the computer how you can turn a sine into a cosine either, you just have uh, as well, but you, you just have to shift the other, uh, the other direction. So sine waves can, or sine curves can be turned into cosines with a phase shift of pi over 2. Cosines can be turned into sines by a phase shift of pi over 2. And of course, we talked about the other identities that we learned a minute ago. And then, to wrap it all in a bow at the very end, the final thing we talked about, on the computer anyway, is that as you phase shift, it, if you kind of like, as time goes on, continue the phase shift, then you can make this wave propagate in time and actually, in real life, carry energy, like energy from the sun, energy from a microwave transmitter, energy from a radio wave, or whatever it is, gamma ray burst in space. These waves carry energy. The way they carry energy is they have to propagate. The way a sine propagates is to allow the phase shift to increase with time. That's how we mathematically write it down. And I showed you there that when you allow the phase shift to always go up with time, then you get a traveling wave. Now, this is not a physics class or an engineering class, but I just can't help but tell you why this is, why we care. about. If I just did the lesson on why do we shift shifting cosines, you would be like, I don't care. Literally, you'd be like, who cares? But when I say all of communications, like every single communication device you've ever used relies on the idea of understanding a phase shift because it's a propagating wave, then you maybe take a little more notice and so on. So I'd like you to watch this a second time and work these problems again. Then follow me on to the next lesson. We're going to continue learning how to graph shifted, phase shifted, sines and cosines.